All right, friends. So I gave you, during that break, I gave you a, a new packet of notes that we're going to start. Today we'll go for a little less than 20 minutes, and then we'll be done for this Wednesday. Uh, and so we spent our first part of our year hopefully giving you guys a pretty solid grasp of the entire story of Scripture from beginning to end, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22 21. And hopefully you've seen how the entire Scripture fits together as one story that points us to Jesus. And so now we're going to take a slight turn, and we're going to take a moment to examine the gospel. Okay? Now, I know that I'm teaching at a Christian school, and I'm teaching a bunch of kids who have been in church basically all of their life. So I'm probably the 10,000th person to talk to you about the gospel. And I know that. But what I want to make sure that we have in this room is that for the rest of this year, for the rest of your life, when people start talking about the gospel, it's a word you understand. It's a word that you are comfortable with. It's a word that you can explain to unbelievers. So what is the goal of this study other than Dobbs to sit up? Let me just tell you right off the bat. If you are a Christian, which like I said, I have, I have no reason to doubt that everyone in this room is a Christian. So if you're a Christian, the goal is to do one of four things. First, make your, here's your blank, heart. Make your heart full of joy and praise for Jesus. Now, I know that sounds sappy, but this is a classical school. We teach you Latin in middle school. And the temptation here is for us to jam your brain full of facts. Now, we, we want to learn. We're at school. But the goal here is that you would learn things about Jesus that would then go to your heart and make you a joyful, praising person. The second goal is to give you more, and here's your blank, confidence. To give you more confidence to share the gospel with friends and family. I have no reason to doubt that Georgia Brooks is a follower of Jesus, but I want Georgia Brooks to be able and eager to share the good news of Jesus with people that she knows aren't believers. The third goal of your Christian is to show you how, here's your blank, important. To show you how important the gospel is to the life of the church. Now, just based on the fact that you're here at Westminster, I know that every single one of you is actively involved in church. I have at least two pastor's kids in here, if not more. Maybe I got more in here. So I know that we're actively involved in church, but I want to show you how the gospel is what's central to our life as Christians, life together as a church. And the fourth goal, if you're a Christian, the goal of this study is to help you, here's your blank, believe. Help you believe, George, the gospel truth more deeply. Right? I want you to feel comfortable and confident that you're banking your entire soul on Jesus, and he's not going to let you down. Now, I've said a couple of times today, I have no reason to doubt that anybody in here is not a Christian, but I also need to be upfront that I don't have an x-ray machine. I can't see Annalise's heart or McKeever's heart. I, I can't see any of your heart. I can't even see my heart. And I do know that as a Bible teacher, the scariest words in the Bible to me are in Matthew chapter 7. You'll memorize them later this year, Lord willing. And Jesus says on Judgment Day, many people, and that word many is terrifying. Many people are going to stand before Jesus thinking they are Christians, and they're going to be horrified to find out they are not. So I take nothing for granted in this. I didn't sit at home and think, yeesh, that second period's awful. I need to give them something to scare them because I want them to all get saved. No, I take seriously the words of Jesus, and I don't want any of you to be in that category of the many people. So we're going to explain the gospel here. So the goal is if you're not a Christian, the goal is to make you, here's your blank, think to make you think about the good news of Jesus. I can't put you in a headlock and make you believe. I can't throw a rope around you and drag you into heaven. All I can do is give you the gospel clearly and make you think about it and hopefully make you want to give your life to Jesus Christ. Keeper, do you have a question? Yeah, how do you know? Like, is this like impossible not to be No, no, in fact, just the opposite. Uh, Lord willing, later this year, we'll read 1 John. And 1 John says multiple times that he is writing so that you may know that you're a Christian. Okay? God does not want, I mean, think about this. I always use my boys as an example because they're pictured right here and I love them. But do you think that I want them to know that I'm their father? Yeah. yeah. Would I be a good dad if I left them floating around for 20 years, never knowing for sure if I was their dad or not? No. 
Like, and I'm a bad father, right? I'm a sinful father. So how much more does your heavenly father keeper want you to know that you're a follower, that you're one of his kids? Much more. So we can know. And I hope that will be one of the results of this, is that you will know that you know that you know that you know that you belong to God. So let's talk about finding the gospel in the Bible. So what we're going to start off by is asking this question, why do we believe what we believe? What is our ultimate source of truth? In other words, what's our, here's your blank, authority? We're asking the question, what's our authority? And there are four sources of authority. The first would be, here's your blank, tradition. Tradition. Tradition would say, we believe what we believe because somebody else, maybe your parents, maybe your church, maybe your friends, told us to. And there's nothing wrong with tradition. I don't expect my four-year-old boys, when they're four, to fully understand the gospel, but I want them to believe that Jesus is good because I told them that he is, right? So tradition is good. Your parents are good. Listen to your parents. The second source of authority that we have in our life is intelligence, right? We believe what we believe because you figured it out. And praise God, I'm looking at nine very smart kids who have brains that they should use. Maybe more than they're currently using them, but you know, you use them. You have good brains. Good job. Good brains. The third source of our authority is, here's your blank, experience. We believe what we believe because we've been through something. Again, there's nothing wrong with experience. Just like there's nothing wrong with tradition, there's nothing wrong with intelligence. All of these are good. You should use all of these. But none of them are ultimate. For the Christian, our ultimate source of knowledge is, drum roll, just kidding, you're not going to be surprised, Scripture. Our ultimate source of knowledge is Scripture. We believe what we believe because God has said so. God has spoken to us in his, here's your blank, word. God has spoken to us in his word. And because it's God speaking in the Bible, two things follow from that. Two implications, ooh, logic word, two implications of the fact that it's God speaking to us in his word. One, the Bible cannot, here's your blank, fail. God can't fail, so his word can't fail. And two, the Bible is completely, here's your blank, true. So this is God speaking, therefore, the Bible can't fail, therefore, the Bible is completely true. And that is our ultimate source of authority. Your parents are wonderful, but can your parents fail? Yes. Your brains are wonderful, but can your brains fail? Yes. Experience is wonderful, but can experience lead you astray? Yes. Only God's word is the one perfectly reliable source of authority. So we believe what we believe. Because the Bible says so. I don't know if you know this, the Bible is a really big book. 1,189 chapters, over 30,000 verses, something like, I think, two to two and a half million words. It's a really big book. So which of those words are the gospel? Well, in one sense, it's all the gospel because it's good news that God is speaking to us. But in another sense, we need to look at specific sections of the Bible so that we can understand the gospel message. So what we're going to do in the rest of this first lesson here, uh, we won't finish today, but what we're doing is we're going to look at slices of Scripture and see how the biblical authors explain the gospel. So let's look first at the gospel in Romans 1 through 4. The first thing that Paul tells his readers after introducing himself is that it's God to whom they are, here's your blank, accountable. It is God to whom they are accountable. In other words... Everybody answers to somebody. Everybody has a boss. Okay? Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, richest man in the world, he answers to God. He may not think so, he answers to God. Here's how Paul puts it in Romans 1, 18 through 21. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, then honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, I cannot overemphasize how important that passage was, but I know that maybe some of you didn't get the full gist of that message. So Psalm 19 tells us that the heavens, creation, declares the glory of God and that 
every day, 24-7, 365, creation is shouting to everyone on the planet, God made me, and he's awesome. And God made us in such a way that every single person on the planet hears that message. You cannot escape it. You cannot not know it. Everybody on the planet, everyone you're talking to, I don't care if they say, I have atheists tattooed on my chest. I'm the president of the atheist club. Psalm 19 and Romans 1 tells us they know there's a God. They know that God made them. They know that God should worship them. But look at verse 19. Sorry, verse 18. It says that all people suppress the truth. So every single person on the planet, when you were born, McKeever, Ava, Georgia, me, every single one of us, when we were born, at some point, we became aware of the fact that God made us, and he's awesome, and we should worship him, but in our sinful nature, we did not want to. So we took that truth, and we shoved it down and said, no, absolutely not. Every single person. So at some point in this unit, you're going to ask the question, what about people who never hear about Jesus? Do they go to hell? And according to Romans 1 and Psalm 19, yes. Because we do not go to hell for rejecting Jesus. We go to hell because we have rejected God. And everyone knows about God. Think of it like this. When you're drowning in the ocean and someone throws you a life preserver and you don't grab it, it's not the life preserver that killed you. It's the water that killed you. So if no one throws you a life preserver, it's still the water that drowns you. So if you, all of us, are born drowning in the wrath of God, if we hear the gospel, it's like someone throws a life preserver to us. And if we don't grab it, we're still drowning because we're in the wrath of God. But if we never hear the gospel, then no one throws a life preserver to us, but we're still drowning in the wrath of God. We are all accountable to God. We are all guilty before God. That's what Paul, the point he's making in Romans 1. We have sinned, back in your notes, we have sinned by not, here's your blank, honoring God. We do not honor him. We don't give him the praise due his name. And we have sinned by not, here's your blank, thanking God. And that's thanking as in like, thank you for this present, right? Thanking God. What Romans 1 makes clear is that we are, here's your blank, made by him. So God made us. Second, we are owned by him. Since he made us, he owns us. And third, we are, here's your blank, dependent on him. Okay? Dependent on him. So the first thing Paul tells us is that we are all accountable to God. And that's bad news because the second thing that Paul tells us is that our problem is that we have, here's your blank, rebelled against God. It wouldn't be a problem if we're accountable to God and we were obeying God. But no, the problem is we're accountable to God and we have all rebelled against him. Romans 1.23. We have all done this. We have all exchanged the glory of a mortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds, and animals, and creepy things. You guys have all studied in humanities different cultures. What do all cultures have in common? They all worship something. They all worship idols. They all create something. They build something in creation. And worship that instead of the true God. And Romans 1 tells us why. Because we don't want to worship the true God. But we have to worship something. God made us as worshipers. The result of this rejection. This horrible trade that we make. Romans 3, nine. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. So what Paul then does is from verses 10 to 18. Paul just basically takes... A human being and dissects them and says we're sinful in what we think we're sinful in what we say we're sinful in what our hands do we're sinful in what our hearts feel we're sinful with where our feet go we are sinful 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 every single person and he closed it up with romans 3 19 it's here in your notes we know that whatever the law says it speaks to those who are under the law which is all of us so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to god for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Now, what, is the go- what does the word gospel mean? What does the word gospel mean? Does anybody know? Good news. good news. It means good news. But if you're listening, so far the good news seems like really bad news. 
God made me. I'm accountable to God. I rebelled against God, and I can't obey my way out of my problem. That's really bad news. And if you think that, you're listening. And that's exactly where you should be. Because Paul doesn't stop after Romans 3.20. He keeps going. And he says that God's solution to humanity's sin is the, here's your blank, sacrificial. The sacrificial, George. The sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans 3.21. After saying how bad things are for 81 verses, Paul writes this. But now, but now. The righteousness of God has been manifested, made visible, apart from the law. Doss, put your head up. All the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So what Paul is going to explain now in Romans 3.21 through 4.25 is that there is a way to be counted righteous instead of, here's your blank, unrighteous. To be counted righteous instead of unrighteous. To be declared innocent instead of, here's your blank, guilty. Every one of us is unrighteous, and if we stand before God in our unrighteous state, he's going to declare us guilty because he is a just judge. But Paul says, oh, there is a way. There actually is a way to be counted as righteous. There actually is a way to have the judge say you're innocent. And it has nothing to do with being the right, here's your blank, race. Being the right race, so this is not just for the Jews or just for the Gentiles or just for redheads or just for short people or thin people or... Anything. It has nothing to do with being the right race. It has nothing to do with trying hard. It has nothing to do with having good, here's your blank, intentions. This is not for people who are the right race. This is not for people who do their best. This is not for people who are nice. Paul says we can be included in this salvation by, here's your blank, trusting. By trusting in Jesus Christ. Now, I choose the word trust intentionally because I want us much as possible to not use the word believe. And here's why. When an American in the 21st century say it says believe, what we all think of is a purely mental activity. Like you believe in Santa Claus. When we say believe, what we all think of is like thinking something's true but having no reason to think it or no evidence to think it, and it doesn't really impact your life at all. But what you're going to find starting tonight as you begin reading the Gospel of John is that when John says believe, which he says like 80 times, he's always using the verb form. Belief is not something that happens up here. Belief is something that you do with your life. So right now, Georgia Brooks is believing in that chair. She's resting her entire weight on that chair. She's trusting that that chair will keep her from falling on the ground. When you get on an airplane, you're trusting in that chair. You're counting or you're counting on that airplane to get you where you're going. And that's what the Bible means when it says believe. Not just some sort of mental activity, but resting your entire weight. We believe in Jesus Christ. Romans 4, 5. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, trusts in him, relies in him, depends on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So we'll end here for today. What page are you on? Four. Four. Yes, we have Yes, you guys have numbers now.